Graham Greene was a British author whose work included both serious literary novels and books that can be classified as thrillers and spy novels, what he called entertainments. His novel, The Ministry of Fear, was written in the middle of World War II and is filled with very specific detail of what it was like to be living through the Blitz. The central character, Arthur Rowe, finds himself accidentally caught up in an ill-defined Nazi plot and spends most of the book trying to find out exactly what is going on around him. His confusion is compounded after a bomb explodes close by, creating several weeks of amnesia, a period during which he is spoken to and treated as though he were someone else. Green is celebrated for his creation of what people have punningly called Greenland, an odd melange of real geography and an unknown spiritual terrain. His characters travel not only through real places, accurately described, but through memories, dreams and psychological habitats. In The Ministry of Fear, these journeys are evident and almost crude, as Green is here writing one of his entertainments, books intended to go on a sales rather than critical kudos. As a result, the internal journeys are externalised. Rowe's voyage to discover himself and the hero he wants to be is rendered through action as well as internal dialogue. His passage is physical as well as psychological. This is most plain in the long middle section, where Rowe loses his memory and becomes Digby, being treated for some unnamed malady at an institute in the country. Rowe must not only recover his true identity by remembering who he was before the bomb exploded, he must also recover his best identity, for early in the book he has been troubled, uncertain and unable to take positive action. Green's style creates an intimacy between us and Rowe, even though we share his confusion. We understand his thought processes and the rationale for his behaviour, but somehow we're still able to see him objectively and question his decision-making. This effect is produced through Green's use of a shifting point of view. Rowe watched them hesitatingly, but it is impossible to go through life without trust. That is to be imprisoned in the worst cell of all, oneself. For more than a year now, Rowe had been so imprisoned. There had been no change of cell, no exercise yard, no unfamiliar warder to break the monotony of solitary confinement. A moment comes to a man when a prison break must be made, whatever the risk. Now, cautiously, he tried for freedom. This passage begins with us inside Rowe's thoughts, hinted at by the hesitatingly. Then immediately Green inserts himself as the commenting author. But it is impossible to go through life without trust. At the end of the paragraph, he helps us see what Rowe is about to do. Cautiously, he tried for freedom. Throughout the book, Green moves in and out of Rowe's consciousness in this way, giving us his thoughts, but then stepping back and either generalising or providing an observation on what's going on. In this section, he reverses the motif and gives the generalisation first. There are dreams which belong only partly to the unconscious. These are the dreams we remember on waking so vividly that we deliberately continue them and so fall asleep again and wake and sleep and the dream goes on without interruption with a thread of logic the pure dream doesn't possess. Rowe was exhausted and frightened. He had made tracks half across London while the nightly raid got underway. Like Cheval and Valeur in their books about Martin Beck, Green frequently uses Rowe's full name, especially at the beginning of the novel. This serves to pinpoint him, to show him in full, as it were. There was something about a fete which drew Arthur Rowe irresistibly, bound him a helpless victim to the distant blare of a band and the knock-knock of wooden balls against coconuts. Arthur Rowe looked wistfully over the railings. There were still railings. The fete called him like innocence. Both of these extracts are from page two of the book, and are in fact the beginnings of consecutive paragraphs. It's almost as though Green, by this time in his career a film critic, is seeing his book filmically, the long shot of the main character as we see him moving amongst other people at the village fete. Slowly we dolly in to see him in more detail. He was a tall, stooping, lean man with black hair going grey, and a sharp, narrow face, 
nose a little twisted out of the straight and a too sensitive mouth. And then we move even closer into his mind to see something of Rose past and his childhood. Arthur Rose stepped joyfully back into adolescence, into childhood. There had always been a fete about this time of the year in the vicarage garden, a little way off the Trumpington Road with the flat Cambridgeshire field beyond the extemporised bandstand, and at the end of the fields the pollarded willows by the stickleback stream and the chalk pit on the slopes of what in Cambridgeshire they call a hill. So Green presents his central character, the only consciousness through which we see the events of the book, by moving us in and out of his thoughts. Sometimes he uses the close third-person style, whereby the prose represents thoughts directly, we read them as he thinks them, and sometimes he simply tells us what Roe is thinking. There was something threatening, it seemed to him, in the very perfection of the day. This isn't the same as writing, he felt threatened by the very perfection of the day. It's at one step removed, fractionally distanced. With these techniques, Green is able to show us exactly as much or as little of Roe's inner life as he wishes. When it suits him, we can be baffled by events, as when Roe wakes up to hear people talking about him under a different name. Or he can move away from Roe's consciousness and offer some generalizations about London or the environment or the war. He is always in charge and in control, and we don't get the sense of being caught up entirely with Roe's sensibility and perceptions. One of Green's main tools enabling him to maintain this distance is his creative use of language, particularly metaphor and simile. Her face was talcumed and wrinkled and austere like a nun's. The old maid watched them with the kind of shrewdness people learn in convents. She swayed in front of them like a figurehead into a drawing room, all orange curtain and blue cushion, as though it had been furnished once and for all in the twenties. He was encircled by Mrs. Belair's enthusiasm, as though by a warm arm. These all appear within two or three pages, and illustrate Green's alert use of language to paint an immediate picture. He could have written, she walked in front of them like a figurehead into a drawing room. But using swayed in front of them is immediately visible, giving us a sense of ballooning size and a languid side-to-side -side motion that is compounded by the like a figurehead simile. We see the image of her sailing like a stately galleon through the room. It's technique like this that keeps Green in control, providing continual visual clues and editorial commentary so that we see precisely what he wants us to see and take from the text the precise meaning that he wants us to learn. In his serious books, as opposed to these entertainments, that teaching becomes more profound and more spiritual and gives those books the depths on which Green built his critical reputation. In his thrillers and spy novels, however, his use of point of view is still on display and is used to manoeuvre us through the twists and turns of the plots so that we never question them or begin to feel that they're removed from reality. His use of point of view places us exactly where he wants us to be. Thanks for watching. There'll be new videos every Monday. It would be great if you could subscribe and hit the notification bell to learn when new videos are online. And hit like if you enjoyed it. Thanks again. Thank you.